أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وما تفرقوا إلا من بعد ما جاءهم العلم بغيا بينهم ولولا كلمة سبقت من ربك إلى أجل مسمى لقضي بينهم وإن الذين أورثوا الكتاب من بعدهم لفي شك منه مريب رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to share with you just a brief a set of lessons from one ayah from Surah Al-Shura. Surah Al-Shura is the 42nd Surah of the Qur'an and this is the 14th ayah. So Surah 42, ayah number 14. Allah Azza wa speaks in this ayah about an archetype in regards to disagreement within this ummah, within a nation of people that believes. And we of course are not the first nation, we're not the first ummah that had iman. They were the nation before us, that came before us, that also had iman. And we're not the first ones that have disagreements with each other. There were nations before us, even despite the fact that they believed that they disagreed with each other. Nowadays, it's not very shocking for you to say, how can believers disagree with each other? Because pretty much any Muslim you talk to knows of Muslims having disagreements with one another. Whether they are religion-based or not, but for the most part, they're based in some way, shape or form in the religion. We have religious disagreements with each other. Allah Azza wa Jal speaks in this surah, in this, in this particular ayah, about a particular brand of people within the religious community, within the believing community, that engages in the act of falling divided among each other. They fall, they fall into division. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَمَا تَفَرَّقُوا they didn't, they didn't fall divided at all. إِلَّا except مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْعِلْمِ Except after knowledge had already come to them. Knowledge came to them, and only after knowledge came to them, they fell into disagreement. Now of course, people that have religious knowledge, we call them ulama, scholars. And scholars, mind you, are the means by which this ummah is united. The people of knowledge of religion are the means by which the ummah is united. But there's a certain breed of people that actually have, a, have religious knowledge. But they don't use that knowledge to cause unity, they use that knowledge to cause disunity. To cause disunity. And how did they do so? Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "وَمَا تَفَرَّقُوا إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْعِلْمُ بَغِيًا بَيْنَهُمْ." The key word here is "بَغِيًا" in the ayah. "بَغِي" in the Arabic language, the closest thing I can think of in English is the urge to dominate the other. You have this ego, you have this pride, you have this self, the sense of self, and your concern is to overpower someone else. So a king or a ruler trying to invade the land of another or to annex is engaged in this baghi. This, this baghi is just the urge to dominate the other party. Allah Azza wa Jal uses this word in, in the Arabic language, it can be interpreted in two ways. It could be called what's, what's termed a maf'ul lahu or a hal. And we'll discuss the meanings in English at least, what the implications are of these two grammatical analyses. On the one hand, Allah says, the way in which they disagreed, the way in which they disagreed was arrogant. The means of their disagreement was full of this, you know, this urge to dominate, this ego. So you could see in the way that they're arguing with each other that there's a lot of ego involved. It's really not about the issue. It's really not about who's right and who's wrong. That's not really the case. Even though they're giving evidences and they're citing a hadith and ayat, and before us, the people of the book before us cited their books when they argued with each other. But the real reason wasn't that they're genuinely in disagreement. The real reason was, I want to prove that I'm right, and I want to prove that he's wrong. That was the real reason. This is baghiyan baynahum. Right? So, the way in which they argued was arrogant. Also, maf'ul lahu, which means the reason for which they argued. The reason for which they disagreed was their ego. 
So one is the means with which they argued, an arrogant fashion of argument, and then the purpose of the argument, the purpose of falling into division, is something deeply rooted inside an ego. And this is something that a Muslim has to be very careful about. Because in our times, we fall into disagreement all the time. And this is one of the great plagues of this ummah across the globe, and especially even here, we're not an exception in the United States. We're not an exception. You have people saying, don't listen to this shaykh or that shaykh, or don't listen to these people or those people, or this group or that group, or this masjid or that masjid. All because I have the haqq, I have the truth, and these people are on the batil, they're false. You know, in Islam, when you want to correct someone, when you want to correct someone, you're not correcting them because you want to overpower them, or you want to prove to them how wrong they are and how right you are. You want to correct them because you want to benefit them. We have this genuinely shared love among ourselves that we all share La ilaha illallah. So when you correct someone, you correct them out of humility and out of love. Allah Azza wa describes this attitude, أَذِلَّةٍ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ They're humbled, they're overpowered when they deal with other believers. They don't come to them full of ego, they come to them full of humility. But you will find among us a trend that when we correct one another, we correct one another as though we're talking about some enemy of Islam. Someone that we have to completely humiliate in order to correct them. Now you tell me, if somebody tries to correct you in that way, would you rather listen to them or would you rather fight back? So what we end up doing is, we end up putting more fuel on the fire in the means, by the means with which we disagree with one another. There's certain ethics in the way a Muslim disagrees with another Muslim. Right? Look at our, look at our ulama, when they would disagree with the opinion of another scholar, first they would make dua for that scholar. And say, Rahimahullah. May Allah reward him. May Allah bless him. And then they would say, we respectfully disagree with this one thing. And Allah knows best. <laughs> they would add at the end, and Allah knows best. But you find this is not the case nowadays. What, what the case is nowadays is the Muslim comes to the other Muslim, and he says to him, you're not doing this right by the way. Let me tell you what the haqq is. And this especially happens with our youth. They take a class or two, or they read a couple of articles on the internet, and now they're ready to fight with their parents. Or they're ready to correct the imam. Or they're ready to interrupt a khutbah even. To say, no, you're on the batil, your aqidah is incorrect. Whatever the case may be, however con convinced you are that the person is wrong. Are you doing more good by causing a scene? By causing this division? Is your intent to benefit this person or to harm him? So the question becomes, are we really correcting one another because of a genuine concern to make things better for all Muslims, to all, for all of us to be on the right path? Or are we correcting one another because there's this ego involved? And when this ego does get involved, let me tell you what happens. Allah Azza wa Jal didn't leave, this, leave us in the dark here. This ayah, in the first part of the ayah, Allah tells us that they rebelled for, or they disagreed and they fell into disagreement for this reason, baghiyan baynahum. Baghiyan baynahum. And then Allah lets us know that this is not something Allah is happy with. This is something that brings about the wrath of Allah. What Allah brought is the truth. And the truth should be a means of unity. It should be a means of unification. And incidentally on the side, before we go on, I want to share one more thing with you from the sunnah of our Messenger wasallam. You know the Messenger of Allah wasallam is obviously, obviously delivering the truth. Anybody who accepts Islam has accepted that Muhammad wasallam speaks on behalf of revelation that has given, been given to him by Allah. So, of course, all the Sahaba are convinced that he speaks the truth, but even then Allah tells him, you better deal with your Sahaba, your companions in a certain way. Allah says to him, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ Now listen, this is profound. In Surah Ali Imran, he says, it is by the mercy of Allah alone that you are lenient towards them, meaning the Sahaba. So Allah is telling him, it's Allah's mercy that our Messenger وسلم, is lenient to the Sahaba. And then he says, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضَّنْ غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ Had you been tough, hard-hearted, had you been harsh, لَنْ فَضُّوا مِنْ حَوْلِكْ They would have run away from you. Allah says about the Sahaba, they would have dispersed away from who? From the Messenger of Allah wasallam. Only if he did one thing wrong, which he didn't by the way. And what's that one thing? If he was harsh. If he was harsh, the Sahaba would have run away from the Messenger of Allah. This is what Allah says, Subhanahu wa Taala. فَعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ 
Look at the advice being given to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Lovingly forgive them. Fa'fu anhum. They will make mistakes. They will disappoint you. When Muslims work together for any cause, that we're working to build a masjid, we're working at an MSA, we're working for an Islamic organization, we're working on a da'wah project, we're working on an Islamic school, a Sunday school, all these projects. When Muslims work together, things come up. You uh, you end up arguing with one another. At some meeting, your opinion is not taken. Or somebody went one way and you were deciding to go another way. Or there was some assignment that you gave to someone and they didn't fulfill it. Happens. It's, it's a part of life. Right? We fall into disagreement. And of course, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu it's very possible at some point someone will make a mistake that will disappoint the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa What advice does Allah give His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa He says, number one, fa'fu anhum. Forgive them lovingly. Meaning, there's one thing to say, it's okay, don't worry about it. Right? You mess up. And your boss says to you, it's okay, don't worry about it. But you could tell from his face that it's not okay. That there's still something wrong, right? And there's a kind of pat on the back, relax, don't make a big deal out of it, forget it, forget it ever happened. Then you feel a little relieved. The messenger is being told basically to give the pat on the back, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fa'fu anhum. Then Allah says, don't stop there, wastaghfir lahum. And ask forgiveness for them. How do you really know you've forgiven someone? When, when you're making dua for yourself, when you're making dua for your mother, when you're making dua for your children, you're also making dua for the one that has offended you or has disappointed you. وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ And then on top of that, this is the most profound. It's incredible. In, in the sunnah of our Messenger wasallam, the quality of leadership, the quality of the one who had the most knowledge among the people. Allah Azza wa Jal says to him, وَشَابِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Consult them when you make a decision. Take their shura. Also, the name of the surah we're discussing here, even though that ayah is from Ali Imran, is shura. Shawirhum fil amr. Take their consultation, take their opinion in decision making. Now, let me ask you this: the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Allah says about him, "Wa anil hawa." He doesn't speak on his own vain desire. He speaks based on revelation. Does he need to consult anybody before he makes the right decision? No, he doesn't need to consult anyone. But Allah tells him to consult who? The Sahaba radiallahu anhu ajma'in. Especially the ones who he has just forgiven. Why? Because you know, even after he forgives the Sahabi, even if he forgives him, the Sahabi still feels it used to be different before this issue. He forgave me, but now things are not the same as they used to be. But if the Messenger asks him, what's your opinion? Give me your input. All of a sudden he feels things are back to normal. The Messenger asked me sallallahu alayhi wa now it means there's nothing left in his heart against me. So to ensure there's nothing left, not an inkling of pain left in the hearts of the companions, radiallahu anhu ajma'in, Allah commands His Messenger, وَشَابِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ وَشَابِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ And He makes it clear, it's not because you need their decision, who's in the end going to make the decision? The Messenger of Allah Himself. So Allah ends the ayah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ When you reach the decision, when you are convinced, فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ then put your trust in Allah, meaning that's the, ma- the matter is closed. The decision was, was actually in your hands. Now we come back to this ayah, the ayah at hand. Allah Azza wa Jal is speaking about disagreement. Disagreement. On the one hand, we have the example of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is making every, he's making sure of every finest detail, that the group does not fall into division. That they don't fall into division. He's making sure they remain cohesive. And on the other hand, there is us. The way in which we disagree with each other is so ugly, and it's so violent, and it's so merciless towards the other, sometimes it puts us to shame. We treat the, the people that are not Muslims, and I'm not saying treat non-Muslims in a bad way, but we treat non-Muslims in a much nicer way at the grocery store, but at the checkout counter, or when you're pumping gas at the station, or your boss at work, or the secretary. And we treat the Muslim brother or the sister much, much worse when we come to the masjid. Much, much worse. We disagree with each other and get annoyed with each other over really small things. Really, really small things. And this brings about the wrath of Allah Azza wa Jal. He says, وَلَوْلَا كَلِمَةٌ سَبَقَتْ مِنْ رَبِّكْ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى Had it not been a word that had already come from Allah. A word, it is a word of Allah that had already been declared, meaning Allah has already decided when this act will be punished. Of dividing among yourselves. Allah already decided a, day, a date, a fixed deadline. That date will be the date when this, this act will be punished. If Allah hadn't already fixed that appointment, لَقُضِيَ بَيْنَهُمْ Their matter would have been declared already. 
the punishment would have come right away. The only reason they're not being punished now is Allah decided that their punishment will come later. And Allah knows the wisdom in that. We don't. لَقُضِيَ بَيْنَهُمْ But then He lets us know of the consequence of this behavior, of Muslims disagreeing with each other. He lets us know of the consequence of this. The consequence of this, of course we are divided, we're disunited, but the real consequence of this is in the next generation. Not in your own generation, in the next generation. Allah says, وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُورِثُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ And it is no doubt, those who were given the book to inherit after them, those who inherited the book after them. Allah didn't say, أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ They were given the book. إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ بَعْدَهُمْ No. Not the believers after them. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُورِثُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ Those who were given the book in inheritance after them. Meaning, they got it from their fathers, from their mothers. They got the book, they got the religion because they were born in Muslim families. They were born in a community which was engaged in disagreement. What happened to these kids, this next generation of Muslims supposedly? لَفِي شَكٍ مِّنْهُ مُرِيبٍ First of all, they have no confidence in their faith. لَفِي شَكٍ Shak is a kind of doubt that takes the confidence away from you. You're not sure about something. And then murib, a kind of raib, a kind of doubt that keeps you from going forward. So every time they, you know, there's an issue of halal or haram, the right or wrong according to the dictates of this deen, they're not so sure if that's the thing they're supposed to do. The next generation is in doubt about the religion altogether. Because the generation before was too busy fighting. It was too busy fighting. You know something that happened in the Muslim world? that those of you that come from the Muslim world already know. In the Muslim world, let's take Pakistan, India for example, where I come from. Muslims are basically divided into multiple camps. But if you want to generalize, there are two basic camps. There's the religious Muslims, somehow religious, whatever affiliation they may have. And then there's the more secularized, modernized Muslims. The Muslims that are not very religious. The Muslims that are sort of cut off from religious learning altogether. And you know the people, they're all, they all call themselves Muslims by the way. But you know, if you ask the average educated, secularized, or semi-secularized Muslim, why don't you learn more about the religion? Why don't you practice it? I mean, after all, you're Muslim. Why don't you practice it? You know what they say? Oh, these mullahs, they're always fighting each other. What am I, you want me to turn like them? You want me to be like them? Go, look, go to every masjid. One guy's giving khutbah against that guy, that guy's giving khutbah against that guy. Every group is saying, you're not in this group, don't come to this masjid. Don't go to that masjid. This is as crazy as it gets in the Muslim world. And we're no exception. We're not as crazy because the law doesn't let us be. It's the only reason. But I've seen insanity here too. In the masajid, people speaking against other groups, people speaking against imams and da'is. You don't know them, you have never spoken to them in person, but yet you have the audacity to say, this person is not on the haqq, they're, they're evil, they're, you know, they're on falsehood, this and that. It is, it is to the level of ugliness. So the average Muslim who doesn't even come for five prayers, doesn't even pray five times at home, the only time they show up at the masjid by accident, by the mercy of Allah, is for Jum'ah prayer, and they hear this nonsense. They hear this on the mimbar. Would they ever want to come back? Would they ever be sure about their religion? They fall into more doubt about it. وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُورِثُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ لَفِي شَكٍّ مِّنْهُ مُرِيبٍ I go around the country, and subhanAllah, wherever I go, I meet some parents, they say, I, I want you to talk to my kids. Can I invite you to my house? I want, to I want you to talk to my kids. And I talk to these kids, and you know the kinds of questions they have? I get Muslim families, Muslim families, for generations, and their kids are asking me questions like, how do you know for sure God exists? What's wrong with homosexuality? What's wrong? I'm not so, I don't, they're not killing anyone. What's wrong with it? So what if I hang out with guys? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not like I'm, you know, doing anything worse. And if somebody does drugs or things, I mean, these are Muslim kids asking these questions. They're not asking in front of their parents, they're asking away from their parents, so I don't tell their parents, but... The fact is, they're in doubt. They're in doubt. Where did this doubt come from? The generation before was too busy in argument. Why were they arguing? They were arguing because they had this ego inside. I'll call it out. I'll be blunt this time. Across this country, I've seen arguments like 8 Taraweeh versus 20 Taraweeh. Eid on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. Right? The disagreement within the Muslim. Should our Imam be an Arab? Should be an Afri African American? Should, be, should he be a Desi? Should he be this or that? Right? Who should give the khutbah? These are the disagreements between the Muslims. 
And a lot of times the Muslims who are disagreeing about these things, fighting tooth and nail, don't even know what the issue is. They don't even know why Eid should be on this day or that day. They just say, that guy is a different race from me, in the back of their head, therefore I can never agree with him. Oh, those Arabs, oh, those Desis, they're all the same. Oh, those brothers, they don't understand, that community doesn't understand, and they're fighting it out. They're fighting it out. And who's being lost in all of these fights? Our youth. The ones that are suffering is the next generation. Wallahi, I tell you one true story and, and I'm done inshaAllah ta'ala. One true story, that hurt, it's, it hurts me. It hurts me. I was in this community and they were, I was invited to two dinners. The community was half Indo-Pak predominantly and the other half was Arab community. And because I speak a little bit of Arabic, I broke the ice with the Arab brothers and my Punjabi is okay. So I made good friends with Desi uncles too. So I got invited one night to a Desi household where all the brothers got together. Of course, which brothers? The Desi brothers. And the other night I got invited to the, the Arab community and you know, I, had, I hung out with the brothers on the other side. The fight between this community, no need to mention names, was which Imam should we hire? Should he be an Indian Imam? Because the majority is Indo-Pak and we're Hanafi, so we should have a Hanafi Imam. And the other side, no, we need an Arab Imam because Arabic is the language of Islam. And you know, the, the Sunnah is to speak in, you know, the Islam, actually not the Sunnah, but the, the Islam promotes the Arabic language, therefore we need an Arab Imam. So who was promoting an Indian Imam? The Indo-Paks. Who was promoting an Arab Imam? The Arabs. And when I go to one side, they're trying to say, why don't you convince them of an Indian Imam? And I go to the Arab families, and what do they say? Why don't you convince them of an Arab Imam? And I went to both of them, and I said the same thing. Let's assume you get the top-notch scholar that you want. The best scholar, cracks the best jokes in, in Hyderabadi Urdu, or, you know, or in you know, dialectical Egyptian, Ammiya, and you're really happy with him. Your kids... The, the Indo-Pak kids, the African-American kids, the Arab kids, the Turk kids, the Indonesian kids, the kids of the people that have recently accepted Islam from varying ethnicities, their kids, can they understand these Imams? No. They're not really concerned about their next generation. They're not. Who are they concerned about? Themselves. It's like this nostalgia of back home. I want to feel like it used to feel when I was younger and I used to listen to that Imam, so I want my Imam to remind me of the old days where I used to be. And the one being sacrificed in all of this is who? The kids that are barely awake in the khutbah. The kids when the khatirah is being presented, they're outside playing basketball. Or worse. Or worse. Who, what are we doing this for? Who's gonna be filling these, these rows in 20 years? Who's gonna be there? We haven't thought ahead. And in these, in these arguments we have against each other, the only one suffering is the next generation. They're the only one suffering. There's nobody to talk to them. You see these youth, right? They have problems. Your kids, the vast majority of Muslim kids, they go to public school. They do. And in public school, everything goes. I mean, I went to public school in New York in the 90s, and that was bad. But nothing. Those were good times compared to now. A lot has changed in 12 years. It's, it's insanely different. Your kids hear things, they see things, they know things that you don't even know exist. They have vocabulary that's out of your scope. They know words you've never heard before. But if you knew, if you know what they mean, you'd have a heart attack. And your boy at school, or your daughter at school, in high school, some boy comes to her, and he says, you have pretty eyes. Wanna go out sometime? And your boy at school, some other girl comes to him and says, you're kind of cute. Is he going to tell you? He's not going to tell you. Because if he tells you, you're going to go crazy. I should ship you back to Pakistan. You know, this, this is my solution. Or I'm, as a punishment, I'm putting you in Islamic school. Or you better memorize Quran now. <laughs> you think that's going to solve the problem? Our kids have no one to talk to. So you know who they end up talking to? They end up talking to their non-Muslim friends who say, hey, she thinks you're cute, right? That's probably a good thing, go for it, man. So they cut, them, they cut themselves off from their parents. And they find a new affiliation with those who have no religion. Those who have no values. Whose fault is all of this? Whose fault is all of this? It is us, the elders, I myself included, I'm a parent too. We are too busy in these petty disagreements. And we've lost sight of the bigger priority, which is our children. Our kids, they need someone to talk to, they need counsel. The masjid is supposed to be their refuge. 
You ask the average youth in the average Muslim community in this country, would you like to go to the masjid? You know what they're gonna say? No. What am I gonna do there? I don't understand what they talk about. And half the time these uncles are fighting anyway. That's what they say. Well, I'd rather go with my friends, go see a movie, go play pool. We've made the masjid unattractive for young people. We've done that. That's our fault. But it's not too late. We learn these lessons from Allah's book. That the next generation fell into doubt about their religion, nothing can be worse. Nothing can be worse. If your kids are far from the religion, what's gonna happen to their kids? And if their kids are even worse, what's gonna happen two generations, three generations from now? I met a Lebanese Muslim in New York City. He became, he actually took his shahada when he was 18. After he did some research into his family tree, his family came from, uh, from, from Lebanon a hundred years ago to New York. A hundred years ago they migrated. They became Christian 60 years into their migration. They had converted, completely assimilated. Why? Because the next generation fell into doubt. And he just kind of rediscovered Islam, took shahada again. Revived the religion of his forefathers. On the day of resurrection, all of us that are parents, all of us that are elders, we are going to be responsible before Allah for who? Ourselves and our children. And if we messed up with our kids, and as a result they messed up with their kids, and so on and so forth, the entire lineage that is messed up will come back to haunt who? Where the problem began. Where the problem began. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal, وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ imama For a reason. Make us imam over muttaqeen. Make us imam over those who have taqwa. Leaders over those who have taqwa. Because on the day of resurrection, we're gonna need that. We're gonna need that. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal, my intent of this talk was not to offend anyone, or not to knock on, on any ethnicity, or to say, you know, this imam is bad and that imam is good. We have respect, the most respect for all the ulama in this country. They are a blessing of Allah Azza wa Jal. All of them. But my advice, my sincere advice, just based on the things I've seen as I've traveled around, is that we take the matter of you know, retaining the love of this deen in the next generation a little more seriously. And in light of that priority, we overlook these other disagreements that we have. They are less important in comparison to what's happening to our children. We have to address this problem. It's a matter of emergency. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us a serious concern for our future generation. May Allah Azza wa Jal unite the hearts of all of the Muslims and remove the petty disagreements that lie within us. And may Allah Azza wa Jal cleanse our hearts and give us a love of each other based on La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ulaik. Jazakumullah wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.